ChatGPT, yes! Ever felt like your favorite authors might have been secret time travelers? Nope. <laughs> No, I have a Dave who wrote today's script. From ships mimicking the Titanic's fate to 1940s comic predicting our smartwatch obsession and a 19th century French dude foreseeing moon landings, these storytellers seem to have backstage passes to the future. Join us as we dive into the rabbit hole of literary clairvoyance. It's not clairvoyance, they just, there's, there's lots of stuff that people write. Some of that shit is gonna come true. Where books aren't just stories, they're sneak peeks into cosmic playbook of what's to come. When I was about 11 years old, I read George Orwell's 1984 and thought, cool, story, bro. But this sort of thing never happens. I mean, read it again more recently. I'm not so sure. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, fucking Snowden. <laughs> when it, it's like, I've said, I've said this before, but if someone, when was Snowden like 10 years ago? When did he release all that shit? If someone said to me before Snowden, we'll call it like pre-Snowden, that the government's just spying on everyone all the time, on all their electronic communications. I'd be like, oh, please, that's not possible. And then Snowden came out and I'd be like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's possible and it's happening. <laughs> it's terrifying. Mm, I don't know, but uh, did you ever have the feeling you was being watched? <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love my job, but sitting in front of a screen writing things for people to sit and watch while they sit in front of a screen, coupled with the fact that the depressing amount of people not only believe everything that comes out of the screen, but mindlessly base their opinions and life choices on it, can feel a little bit close to Orwell's vision for comfort. Feeling comfortable? <laughs> Perhaps I'm being a little paranoid. I mean, it's not like wars are breaking out all over the world and governments are telling people which side to believe. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Oh my god, it's totally, it's true. Ah, uh, moving quickly along from that little bit of scaremongering, George Orwell was not the only author who made scarily accurate predictions of the future. So let's get into it. The Simpsons predicted everything. During my youth, I was a huge fan of The Simpsons. Yeah, me too. Uh, it was like, I was never like, see every season or whatever and see every episode like some other shows that i'm a big fan of stargate excellent star trek excellent the next generation excellent voyager particularly excellent enterprise was also great you've lost me vessi is the sponsor of today's episode and uh, i i actually spoke to like the boss i mean i guess not the boss boss but the boss of what i do over at vessi the other day we were on the phone and he was like really liked the uh, the ads where you just kind of went off the rails just just do that so i don't actually have any copy except for the like discount code or whatever so he's just like talk about vessi talk about why you like them and i'm like okay <laughs> can do these actually arrived literally an hour ago both of these in a box from just side story the fedex man arrives yesterday today's tuesday the fedex man arrives with this big box from vessi i'm all excited because i, I think these are, are these storm bursts what are these called? They have them written inside. I always forget. Yes, these are the Stormbursts. I already have a white and a black pair of these. These are the Chelsea boots, I believe. Yes, weekend Chelsea. Oh, the FedEx man. He comes yesterday and he's like, hello, got a delivery for you. And I'm like, brilliant, thank you. And he's like, that'll be, what was it, the equivalent? It'll be like 100 bucks or something. And I'm like, okay, here's my card. <laughs> and he's like, nah, 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 cash only. And I'm like, really, my dude? Cash only? <laughs> what is this? I feel like I'm getting scammed by FedEx. Like, what sort of delivery man comes to your door and is like, cash? He's like, why? Customs. And I'm like, this makes no sense. But I'm like, okay, I don't have $100 on me right now. I just, I, 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 it's the 21st century, my dude. I have a card. I, I, I'll have to go to the ATM. And he's like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. And I'm like, really? No cash machine? No, no card machine, bro? Um, anyway, I open up my besties. I get all excited. I haven't even actually worn these yet. They look awesome. They smell... I kind of did that for effect, but that does smell really good. Uh, it doesn't matter. That's not why you're buying these shoes. Why you should buy these shoes is because they are the best shoes that you will ever wear. Vessi have been sponsoring me. I always said it was two years, but it's probably more like three years now. Since that time, I have basically worn nothing else. I went to a funeral and I wore my Bessies, largely because I forgot my shoes. I went to a wedding quite recently, actually, and I was like, okay. I actually had to go out and buy new smart shoes because 
not that Bessies aren't smart, they're just not quite wedding attire. And I had to buy new shoes because i just been wearing Vessies forever. The selling point about Vessies, other than just being extremely comfortable, good looking shoes, is that they're 100% waterproof. So you look at that and you're like, how could that be waterproof, Simon? It looks just like a regular shoe. And it's breathable just like a regular shoe, except it's 100% waterproof. None of that water resistance. So you can have your like water up to there and it'll be completely fine. Like I've stood, I said I stood in a river and people were like, Simon, you're such a city boy. That's not a river. That's barely a stream. But it did come up to the, the top of the shoes. I mean, a river, I guess, would be proper. And it's like, I did grow up in the countryside. I live in a city now, but I am a country boy. This is Bessie. Yo, guys, you just got to get Bessie. They let me do, they let me say whatever I want in these ad reads. And I love them for it, even though they get long. But I told a FedEx story. That's nice. Little tangent in the ad read. That's what happens when uh, the sponsors like how I do this thing and they like how I do it because you buy these. Bessie.com slash blaze for the perfect blend of style and practicality in shoes designed for urban adventurers. Can you tell that that was written for me rather than my words? I love Bessie. Go check them out. It's amazing. Back to the video. Um, during my youth, I was a huge fan of The Simpsons. Unfortunately, I'm much more likely to spend time these days watching Bluey instead. Yes, Dave. Me, Peppa Pig, Bluey, Mighty Express, all these shows that now I watch. <sighs> Not that there's anything wrong with Bluey, as kids' shows go. I think it's probably one of the best. The dingoes for my baby! It absolutely is. That and uh, fucking love Storybots. Anyone else know Storybots? That shit is dope. However, as of yet, it has not shown the future predicting capabilities that The Simpsons has demonstrated. While you could argue that any program with more than 700 episodes is bound to come up with a few things that actually went on to happen in real life, The Simpsons has been so accurate so often that it's actually led to online conspiracy theories. If you don't believe me, take a look. Be warned though, even a casual Google search can lead you down a rabbit hole that might keep you from doing important things like writing scripts. Well, the good news, Dave, I'm sitting here. So I can't just go over to the computer right now. I'd have to stop the video and do all of that shit, which is just oh, it's a hassle, isn't it? So what exactly has The Simpsons successfully predicted? Well, there are so many to cover that we would really need an entire video, but my favorite of these, the Trump presidency. In season 11, episode 17, Bart to the Future, an episode which shows Lisa as president. I've seen this one. What do you mean you've seen this? It's brand new. President of the United States, we learned that she took over presidency from Donald Trump. <laughs> During a cabinet meeting, she says, As you know, we've inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. The most concerning thing about this is the episode is supposed to be set in 2024. So you can only hope that she's not correct twice. <laughs> Disney buys Fox. Season 10, episode 5, When You Dish Upon a Star, shows the Fox logo as a division of the Disney Corporation. While this was done simply to take the biz out of Fox, something that I believe the writers are contractually allowed to do, it would actually turn out to be remarkably prescient. In 2018, Rupert Murdoch sold Fox to the Disney Corporation for $71.3 billion. Fucking hell, Jesus. Well, he sold most of Fox anyway. The Murdoch family remained in control of Fox News because Disney didn't want it. Number three, the FIFA corruption scandal. Season 25, episode 16, You Don't Have to Live Like a Referee, shows Homer Simpson becoming a referee because there's a world shortage due to mass corruption. I'm afraid there has been an epidemic of referees being bribed to throw games. From the Premier Leagues to the playgrounds, all has been tainted. I think this is probably my favorite, purely because it contains two accurate predictions. Firstly, it shows Germany winning the World Cup, which they did. The game, plus two hours of funeral time, is about to conclude. And with Germany the victor 2-0 in an unprecedented display of rectitude and stubbornness by one Homer Simpson. I've never seen the Brazilians so depressed. Ole. Secondly, in 2015, one year after the series was released, FIFA headquarters were raided by police due to widespread accusations of bribery, money laundering, and fraud. Yeah, like, I don't follow football, but I know that, like, that was... Isn't, allegedly, the Olympics also, like, a bit, you know, dodgy? All these... these <laughs> There's a lot of dodgy things out there, isn't there? E.M. Forster came up with the idea of video calling in 1909. Although video calling has become incredibly popular, I myself have three devices within reach that are capable of this task. I have one. There. 
that's it. But there's probably like at least 19 others in this office that I could do that with. It wasn't until comparatively recently that this technology was available to the world. If any of you remember using Skype before it was purchased by Microsoft, you can attest to the fact that as recently as 20 years ago, setting up and maintaining a video connection was a massive pain in the ass. However, the idea of being able to both speak and see somebody on the other side of the world dates all the way back to 1909. In his short story, titled The Machine Stops, E.M. Forster paints a picture of a world in which human beings have every need catered to them by a machine. Oh my god, I can't wait for that future. Because these humans live in isolated rooms, oh, amazing. They pass the time by watching lectures remotely and engaging in video conferences. Oh my god, I'm really working towards this, aren't I? This is what I do. This is, I just, if I, if I stayed at home, this would be my life. People would, not machines, but like, through the power of machines by like Uber Eats, they'd bring food to me. I'd give video conferences. I'd watch video conferences. Oh my god, Ian Forster, I live in your novel! While it could be argued that the short story predicted the invention of the internet, it very definitely provided a fairly accurate description of future video calling as this extract shows. Quote, But it was fully 15 seconds before the round plate that she held in her hands began to glow. A faint blue light shot across it, darkening to purple, and presently she could see the image of her son who lived on the other side of the earth, and he could see her. While the physical description of the machine used to communicate isn't quite right, you have to give him points for going so far as to predict the connection latency. <laughs> yes, drives me potty. Like, I have a weekly call with my dad, and... Yeah, so off like it was literally last week where I was like, it's 2024. How does this not work properly yet? Because it's like, oh, my AirPods are not, they're connected to my phone instead of my laptop. And then it's like, okay, I got them to connect. It's like, dad, I can't hear you. And he's like, I can't see you. And I'm like, oh, why? Why do we have to live like this? <laughs> The only thing that's really missing from the description is enraged participants shouting at their devices because for the tenth time in as many minutes the feed is frozen, but all in all it's pretty accurate. The pilot episode of Lone Gun- oh, new entry, sorry. <laughs> Dave doesn't always put breaks in, so I, I just continue reading it like it's just flowing text, but obviously it's completely different. Ooh, a bad workman always blames his tools. The pilot episode of The Lone Gunman predicted the September the 11th attack. Life as a paid writer can be pretty sweet. Having a job you can literally do without getting dressed is a bonus, as are those days when your creativity is flowing and you've finished an entire script by 2pm and can spend the remainder of the day lounging around on the sofa. Sadly, it's not all like that. Sometimes there are days when you can't write because you've recently put your hand through a table saw. <laughs> or sometimes you sit for hours and hours in front of the keyboard with nothing to show but the title for your efforts. Days like these can quickly become tiresome. However, whenever this happens, between my frequent trips to the coffee machine, the toaster, and the smoking bench in my garden, I console myself with the thought that at least I'm not Chris Carter, Vince Gilligan, John Scheiben, or Frank Spotnitz. Okay, the guys who wrote the pilot of The Lone Gunman. Imagine how they must have felt. They'd come up with a fantastically gripping story involving murder, government conspiracy, and a plan to crash an aircraft into the World Trade Center. No f***ing way. I'm mapping the data now. Your flight's gonna make an unscheduled stop in exactly 22 minutes. Corner of Liberty in Washington. Lower Manhattan. Not only that, but this story forms the first episode of a new TV series that was broadcast for the first time on the 4th of March 2001, 191 days before the World Trade Center attack. No fucking way. If I had been any of those guys, I'd have been living in constant fear that the FBI were about to kick down my door and arrest me. Jesus Christ. You'd be like, no, 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 I'm a famous writer. I'm not a terrorist. Fortunately, at least until people started drawing comparisons online, the similarities went largely unnoticed. According to Spotnitz, I thought nobody noticed. I guess so few people saw the show, but it's strange too, because that was the pilot and the ratings were actually quite good for that episode, and yet we didn't hear anything. <laughs> Just that silence would be fucking deafening. You're like, why is no one talking about this? FBI, open up! <laughs> Because the internet is the internet, some of the people who claim that the September 11 attacks were an inside job have actually gone so far as to claim that this episode proves that the government was involved and that it was written and released as part of an anti-government warning. 
Really now a conspiracy theorist. Twisted logic there, no? What's so bad about conspiracy theories? They can be fun. Because, you know, the government could organize and keep secret an attack like that that completely failed to prevent Fox from warning people about it in a TV show. People are dumb. Morgan Robertson wrote a piece of fiction that was eerily similar to the story of the Titanic. Everybody knows the story of the Titanic, although I was somewhat surprised that it's now on the teaching syllabus for six to seven year olds in the UK. Really? As a quick aside, if you happen to be in Liverpool and have a spare £300 to drop on a one-night stay in a hotel, I can highly recommend the presidential suite at 30 James Street, the former offices of the White Star Line company who owned the Titanic. That's pretty dope. And £300? I know, like, that's actually pretty reasonable if this is a nice hotel for, like, the presidential suite. I mean, a hotel's got to be pretty nice if it's got a presidential suite. £300 is kind of, let's do it. I I'd do that. I actually stayed in a hotel in Liverpool called... I think it was called Titanic Hotel. It was pretty nice. While I wasn't in a position to enjoy the view, which I was told is excellent, I did enjoy the 10-foot wide bed and bath that could comfortably fit eight people. Wait, did you stay there? Awesome. Okay, now you're just showing off. Anyway, moving on. In 1898, 14 years before the Titanic failed to finish its first official journey, Morgan Robinson released a story, the details of which may be somewhat familiar to you. The allegedly unsinkable ship, the Titan, runs afoul of an iceberg in the North Atlantic. Not only does this collision result in the loss of the vessel, but the ship is similar in size and speed to the Titanic. If that doesn't sound familiar enough, this fictitious ship is not carrying enough light boats for everyone on board. I'm less shocked with this one because I know this one. I feel like I made a video about this. There may be others I've made videos about. I've just forgotten. But this feels more recent that I've covered this. Maybe I did it on Decoding the Unknown, which is another channel you should check out if you like mysteries. Adding even further prophetic creepiness to the story, both ships sank in April. And although there was a rescue ship comparatively nearby, both disasters resulted in a huge loss of life. Just for fun, I decided to ask Simon's new digital best friend about the similarities between the real and fictional ships. ChatGPT! Yes! And this is what it said. While not every detail aligns perfectly, the cumulative similarities between the Titan and the Titanic remain remarkable, prompting ongoing fascination and debate about the nature and co of coincidence and foresight in literature. Having a spare couple of audible credits to spare, I downloaded this story. And in my opinion, this is a fairly accurate observation. Chester Gould gave a character a smartwatch. Again, <laughs> just reading it as if this is part of the previous one, but it's not. <laughs> Professionalism. <laughs> Jester Gould gave his character a smartwatch in the 1940s. If you'd told me that when I was at school, by this time in my mid-30s, I'd be able to make calls, send messages, and even play music and video without the inconvenience of reaching into the pocket and retrieving my smartphone. Yes, smartphones sort of existed when I was at school. I'm not quite that old. Hey! Shut up! I would have been impressed with your fictional creativity. Yeah, we had smartphones at school. Or like, we had PDAs, personal digital assistants that like... What the fuck were they called? I had one by... Hey, Dolph, take a member on your Newton. Beat up Martin. Bah! Oh, who was it by? I don't even remember. It ran like a version of Windows or some shit that looked kind of like Windows 3.1. I'm not that old. I am that old. Um, it was, called like, was it called an XDA? Was it by a company called Compaq? Does Compaq still exist? However, as it transpires, you would not have been being creative at all, as this idea had been around since Chester Gould gave his first comic book character, Dick Tracy, a walkie-talkie watch in 1946. Although this technology was exceptionally mundane by today's standards, according to Gould, his publisher initially rejected the idea, both because it was too unrealistic and because it provided the character with a far too predictable and uninteresting method of calling for backup when criminals thought that this was not possible. Personally, I think the second argument rather cancels out the first, but there you go. Gould wasn't happy with either argument, and after proving that a walkie-talkie that could be worn on the wrist already existed, proceeded to include the device in his comics anyway. As time went on, Dick Tracy's watch became more and more technologically advanced until in the 1960s he could use it to watch television and make video calls. All of this about 50 years before the first version of the Apple Watch was released. Now before people start shouting at me in the comments section that you still can't use an Apple Watch to consume video content, you can. Although it's not part of the native software, you can download WatchTube from the App Store and stream YouTube videos directly to your wrist for as long as your battery holds out. That's cool. 
on a full charge. You may even be able to complete an entire episode of Brain Blaze. Yeah, you'd be lucky. And whose fault is that? French novelist Jules Verne predicted the moon landing with surprising accuracy. Although he is best known for writing 20,000 leagues under the sea and around the world in 80 days, Jules Verne wrote several other stories, one of which is called From the Earth to the Moon. Although he wrote this in 1865, a hundred years before mankind would actually land on the moon, his story contains some details that are remarkably similar to what actually happened. For example, when the three astronauts embark on the life-changing journey, the rocket takes off from Florida, which, as I'm sure you're all aware, is the same place that the Apollo missions launched from. After a successful mission, the three astronauts return to Earth in a similar fashion, parachuting into the Atlantic Ocean before being recovered. Verne even had a crack at carrying out some of the necessary calculations to make the journey. Obviously, these could not have been used successfully to get to the moon, but he does at least take into account some of the physics involved should you wish to use a giant cannon to propel a craft into outer space. Oh, that's not the same. <laughs> Using a giant cannon's problematic, though, no, because it's like you'd have an immediate, enormous amount of thrust, whereas a rocket gradually builds up so the G's, while intense, are not insane. Whereas being fired out of a cannon to get into space, that's gonna be a lot of G-force right there. That's what she said. No time! But she did. No time! All in all, the similarities are striking, if not identical. The story even accurately predicts the number of astronauts chosen to go on the trip. There is one thing that is very different about the end of this story, however. To the best of my knowledge, as I only skimmed through the book, none of the astronauts had to spend the rest of their lives being harassed by insufferable bellends who claim they never went to the moon at all. <laughs> Douglas Adams predicted the Kindle. It would be almost heretical to create a script such as this one without giving a mention to the greatest science fiction writer of all time. In 1978, the radio series entitled The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was released. The series tells the story of a man from Earth, Arthur Dent, who escapes the destruction of his home planet by hitchhiking on a demolition ship with his friend from Beetlejuice, Ford Prefect. The series was so popular that its writer, Douglas Adams, would go on to expand the story with five novels and a TV series. Unfortunately, in 2005, four years after the death of Adams, a movie was also released. The movie sucked so hard that real fans of his work try not to speak of it. It's best we don't. Let's not mention that movie. What movie? Anyway, I digress. In the story, Ford Prefect is in possession of a small device called the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This device is essentially an ebook that contains all the necessary information for anybody who chooses to spend their life hitchhiking around the galaxy. Although the original version of the device contained an old-fashioned keyboard, it would be upgraded to a touchscreen system in later versions of the story. Being a fan of almost any gadget, Adams not only understood that an ebook was vastly superior to a paper version for his fictional hitchhiker, writing that should the guide be produced in paper form, hitchhikers would require several inconvenient conveniently large buildings to carry it around in. He also predicted that such devices would become commonplace in the real world. In recently published notes that he made in the early 90s, he wrote, Lots of resistance to the idea of ebooks from the, from the public, particularly all those people who 10 years ago said they couldn't see any point in typing on a computer. I believe this resistance will gradually disappear as the electronic book improves itself and becomes smaller, lighter, simpler, cheaper. In other words, more like a book. And how right he was. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of this video. If I may, I'll leave you with a thought that I had while compiling this list. Although it appears that many of these things were predicted by fiction, how many of the fictional stories were, in fact, inspiration for inventors, explorers, etc.? Ah, and inspiration for that iceberg that struck the Titanic. First of all, you came to where I live and you hit me! I don't have an answer to that question. I just thought it was an interesting point to mull over. Indeed it is, Dave, and thanks for being here. That's the end of the episode. It's 2024! How does this not work properly yet?